This is a great crowd, and I, I we're delighted to have the Atlantic Council work with us and for us to work with them. It's a great organization, as you will see when I introduce Barry Pavel. Uh, uh, Barry uh, was uh, is a vice president in the Arnold Cantor chair. Now, it's spelled wrong, Barry. <laughs> if we could just change the spelling of your chair, it'd be much better, much, much better. But that's... Uh, he, he has worked for two presidents that I know of, maybe more, Barry, and I don't want to uh, minimize what you've done, but you worked for both George W. Bush and for Barack Obama, National Security Council, assistant to the president. Uh, we are, this is going to be such a great afternoon, and, and we're going to learn a lot, not only from Barry and from Rock, but of course from Steve Hadley. I have known Steve for a long time, not close friends, but long admired what he has done served four presidents if i'm not mistaken uh he is he and barry are two of the greatest experts we have in the u.s maybe in the world i, I would think of the world in terms of national security issues and boy do we have some issues right now so this couldn't be more timely i'm delighted that all of you are here great turnout and barry pavel Thank you, Secretary Cantor, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll go back and talk to our board of directors about changing the, the spelling of my chair uh, for you. But thank you for a, a way too kind introduction, especially after your years and years of service to the, to the U.S. government, which we're all very thrilled to, to acknowledge. Um, and thank you for your willingness to have the Atlantic Council uh, host this event alongside the Pacific Council. We're really thrilled uh, to be here in Los Angeles uh, today for this very, very special event. Um, we're honored that the Pacific Council is willing to, to uh, host us today um, and uh, that such a distinguished group has been assembled. And I think a special acknowledgement, I think the, the Belgian Consul General uh, is here um, today. And um, please know that uh, certainly at the Atlanta Council and I'm sure the Pacific Council um, we're very, very committed in all of our work to continuing to work with our allies, uh, despite what some uh, candidates might say, uh, to counter this very, very important uh, threat to all of us, not just to, to Belgium and Europe, but to the United States and our Middle Eastern uh, partners. So we're, we're very honored that you're with us today as well. Um, we're also obviously very thrilled to ha uh, and privileged to hear Mr. Hadley speak um, about really some of the key strategic issues that are at play in the world. There's a lot of them. They seem to multiply almost every month. Um, but I think with diligence and analysis and hearing uh, great ideas like I'm sure we'll hear today, we can work through, through all of this. At the Atlantic Council in particular, we think that the world is at an inflection point. Uh, and by that we mean it's, it's a very significant period of change from one era of history to another. In our view, very much similar to 1914 to 1945, to 1989, uh, and other really historic dates in global history. Uh, and we think it'll take all of us working together to realize a future that's more prosperous and more secure. This will be harder than in the past, in our view, because we think the world now has not just state actors, the Westphalian actors, but also a lot of very powerful non-state actors. So we call this a Westphalian plus world. Um, and it just makes things more complicated, but it also gives us more opportunities, we think. And a lot of our work is centered on how do we bring non-official voices, like in the audience today, um, to bear on all of the many important issues that we're grappling with as a country. And I have to say, on your website, I want to just quote two sentences from the Pacific Council's website, which I love. Uh, and when I read it, I was like, that's exactly what we're trying to do. It says, quote, we know that foreign policy extends beyond the sum of actions taken by policymakers and diplomats. More and more global thinkers in technology, entertainment, media, business, education, health, science, and the arts serve as brokers of the U.S. relationship with the world. We could not have said it better. This is exactly one of our main items of, of work at the Atlantic Council. How do we bring non-official uh, global strategic thinkers to bear to help us solve 
uh, the problems that that we all face. So that was just perfectly put, and we're going to probably steal that for lots of our other <laughs> lots of our other work. Um, so now more than ever, we we do need clear strategic thinking and imagination which we think is really important. A lot of old bureaucrats like me, we don't have imagination. We just think tomorrow is going to be just like uh, today, but the world is showing that things are changing very quickly. So we need imagination and creativity to help us think about what's coming next. And that includes in our planning and our policy and intelligence, the whole range of activities. And so that's why the council is here today, where we plan to be uh, in the area more. Um, and in fact, just this week, uh, a senior fellow in the Brent Scowcroft Center, uh, Peter Engelke, published an uh, op-ed in the LA Times on water security, uh, which I commend to you. I think it was published Tuesday. And it's, a, it's, a very, uh, uh, it's an area of, of growing work for us. And we're trying to mainstream it into the, the uh, policy community in Washington. And we'll be doing, doing a lot more on that. So you all have new and innovative ideas that DC needs to hear. So please consider this event as a start to that conversation, and I can think of no one better to kick it off than Mr. Hadley, who served as National Security Advisor to President George W. Bush and has spent many years at the highest levels of government on our nation's toughest national security challenges, and Ambassador Schnabel, who also has an equally distinguished record. So with that, I'd like to welcome both Mr. Hadley and Ambassador Schnabel to the stage for for a discussion that I know I'm really looking forward to. And thank you very much again for hosting us. I wasn't even aware of the fact that the Atlantic Council today was co-hosting this. But you're not co-hosting it. We are hosting it. Is that what you said? I'm sorry if I used the wrong words. <laughs> no, that's it. I don't know. I think it's great. I, I have only recently become more familiar with the Atlantic Council having, as I mentioned to you, uh, or, or realizing that the president is a friend of mine and I met with him and we just here sitting today at lunch we said why aren't we working together more we are looking right. <coughs> Atlantic Council East we are looking obviously the other side and there are all sorts of things that we ought to be doing together and today may be the start of something uh, very very uh, interesting Steve um, <clears throat> I am delighted that that you and I are getting together here today at this with this very august group of people the last time I saw you was at a meeting in Brussels when we were preparing a, uh, a visit by George W. Bush to um, NATO and to the EU, which was in 04. Today, the things that are going on in Brussels, of course, are very or dramatically, dramatically different. So we're going to talk about a number of different, different things. You are, uh, obviously, your expertise is in uh, not only Europe, but also China and the Middle East. So there are lots and lots of different issues that we are interested in talking about. But I think it might be um, interesting, very interesting, to start with what happened in Brussels uh, recently. To, um, to what extent do you think that ISIS is driving to upset or to undo the EU as we know it today? And the EU is having all sorts of problems economically and otherwise. But at the, at the end of the day, they are our allies, trading partners, investment partners, partners, well, you can imagine, <coughs> in, in lots of different areas. Is that a mission that the ISIS uh, people are after in basically undoing what Europe is all, all about? And they are, in effect, doing it as we speak. So, Steve, I thought that that might be an interesting question because everybody has been reading about it, of course, in the last two days and, uh, and has questions about that. It's a, it's a very interesting question. And I have to say, uh, talk about the lack of imaginations. You know, anytime someone says you have long ex experience uh, and, and expertise, you know, I, I was thinking sort of Donald Trump sitting on my shoulder saying, if, if you have such great experience and expertise, how comes the world is in such bad shape? <laughs> what have you been doing? Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I have not seen anything to suggest that ISIS is that strategic. That is to say, they have on their agenda destabilizing Europe. Uh, I think Vladimir Putin has on his agenda, if he can get away with it, at an exceptional cost, at acceptable cost, splitting up the EU, showing that NATO is a dead letter, that the United States is not committed 
uh, to NATO and that the United States and NATO cannot protect Central and Eastern Europe because I think Vladimir Putin would like to have the kind of sphere of influence in the former Soviet space and in Central and Eastern Europe that the Soviet Union had. Not that he wants to recreate the Soviet Union, but he would like to have that kind of sphere of influence. And so to the extent the EU breaks apart, to the extent NATO no longer gives the kind of reassurance that it did and opens the door for the kind of subversion that we've seen from Russia in the Ukraine and in Georgia, uh, you know, I think, I think that's a good day for Vladimir Putin. ISIS, I think, uh, is not, you know, self-consciously trying to break up Europe. But I think, as you will say, and you ought to jump in on this conversation, but I think in my lifetime, the European project, the effort to help European countries build a, a region that is whole, free, and at peace, the European project has never been at greater risk than at any time since World War II. Um, it's a whole series of challenges. Terrorism, which has really come home to Europe in a very destabilizing way. Refugees uh, flows that are forcing countries to start almost renationalizing their borders, renationalizing their security. Um, you've got the possibility that Britain will leave the EU. You have a candidate for the president of France, Marie Le Pen, who's running on a platform of taking France out of NATO and out of the EU, a campaign that the press <coughs> says is funded by Russian banks. That's Vladimir Putin again. So I think there is a real risk that, that, that Europe and the EU will, will come apart. And that's a problem for the United States in so many ways. We have economic interests, historical ties, and all the rest. But it's a real problem because if you think about what happened after the end of the Second World War, the United <coughs> States and Europe basically founded an international order based on freedom, free markets, democracy, a variety of alliances and institutions that sustained that order. And um, Europe has been our partner in maintaining that order. That order is under siege from Russia, from China, from ISIS, uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure it survives if we don't have a Europe beside us to try to, as we say, uh, amend, revitalize, and defend that international order. So I think uh, it's, it's probably not ISIS intends to break up the EU, but uh, the, the kinds of refugee flows that their activity is resulting in, the kind of terrorism they're doing, is really ripping at the fabric of Europe. And I worry about where it's heading. On ISIS itself, the attacks that just took place and the criticisms that you hear of the European security apparatus, uh, criticisms that are all over the place at the moment because of what happened, what, what is your, what is ultimately going to be our reaction to all of that. We hear all of the different candidates. We hear the president speaking from uh, no, not only Cuba but Argentina about the subject, obviously. Uh, but what are we really doing about it? We hear about carpet bombing, which would seem to be um, something that sounds good um, when you're running for office somewhere, but it, in reality, of course, doesn't, doesn't work. Um, but wh where do, how do we get out of this? Quagmire. Yeah. <clears throat> and, me, said, and in the meantime, of course, we are creating the refugees that are coming all over Europe and into the United States, and that's all part of part of that issue. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think if you had people from the intelligence services, if John Brennan, for example, head of CIA, were here, he would say to you that the cooperation that the United States has with intelligence services around the world, including in Europe is essential for keeping America safe. So for all the talk about candidates, you know, we're tired of NATO, they're free riders, you know, we don't need them. I think the intelligence services would tell you something very different. The problem with ISIS, and what I makes ISIS much more difficult than, you know, than Al-Qaeda, is that ISIS has achieved something Al-Qaeda dreamed of but never achieved. ISIS has controls territory. 
they can go to the world and say, we have the down payment on a caliphate, a theocratic state run under Sharia law that obliterates national borders, and that is really kind of a religious totalitarianism, and that is brutal, brutal to the people <clears throat> under its sway. And that's what they have established in large portions of Syria and Iraq. And that is uh, the source of their power. It is also the source of their attraction. It is why there are over 30,000 people have gone to Iraq and Syria to support ISIS. And they're not just people from the Middle East, as you'd expect, and as we saw in Iraq with al-Qaeda in, in, in Iraq in 2004, 5, and 6. They are people from all over the world. Over 5,000 of them have come from Europe. Yeah. So there is an attraction of this caliphate uh, that makes it unique and is the engine of this terrorism. And the only way you're going to end that is to take territory away from al-Qaeda, to end the caliphate, to push them back to the point where they're just another terrorist organization. And if you were going to criticize what we've done so far, I think the criticism would be we've said, we've, we've relaxed too much by saying it's going to take a long time. And we have not had the urgency to understand that if you're going to end this terrorism problem and destroy their appeal, you've got to show that they're not 10 feet tall and you've got to take away their territory. And I think people would say we are not moving aggressively enough to do that. Um, we should be, and, and, and it's, there's a debate going on within the administration. A number of people from the Pentagon have given the president options to accelerate taking back Raqqa, which is the ISIS base in Syria, taking back Mosul, which is their base in Iraq, accelerating this process of rolling back ISIS. And I think the challenge for the new president, if things, if they inherit this situation the way it is now, is how much more are we and our allies prepared to do to accelerate the process by which ISIS loses its ter territory? We establish to the world that they are not on a roll, not on continuous conquest, uh, but they are going to be rolled back and they're going to be on just another terrorist organization that we're going to then have to cooperate and manage. That's, I think, going to be the coming debate. And that means us sending troops over there in no. larger numbers, or not, not well, necessarily. Well, you know, there's a, a big discussion about that, and it's very interesting, and, and, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, you want to go back to Iraq at 160,000 troops. Mm. The most aggressive person I know on this is Lindsey Graham, and Lindsey Graham yeah. has said we need 20 or 30,000 American troops. That's the top. Most people take the position of what do, what do we need to do? We need to have better intelligence, which means you have to have more intelligence folks on the ground. You need to step up a bombing campaign, not just bombing terrorists who we think are plotting terrorist attacks against Europe or the United States, but going after the Islamic State as a state and destroying its institutions of power, its infrastructure, the way it gets its money, the way yeah. it controls its population. And then partnering and arming and enabling groups on the ground in Iraq and Syria, and there are them, who are willing to fight ISIS. There are, peop there are boots on the ground already there. And what we need to do is accelerate the pace <coughs> of helping to train and arm and support them as they go after ISIS on the ground. And I think that requires more troops, but it's in smaller numbers of special forces troops embedded with our friends and allies, Sunnis and Kurds, and in, in stiffening them and enabling them to defeat ISIS. And I think they can and they will. So this is not a return to Iraq uh, 2003. This is something that I think, and I think a lot of people in the military think is, is doable. And it's in our interest to do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Why, uh, Steve, why doesn't the issue, the Article 5 issue um, in NATO come into play when you have ISIS doing what they're doing in both, well, in a number of different NATO countries. The, the, it's been called a war. We are at war. Is that not the very basis of Article 5 of NATO that would right. cause us to react to that sort of, but where does that stand? What, where, yeah. do we, where does that go from here? 
Well, as you know, Article yeah. 5 in the NATO Treaty says basically an attack on one NATO country is an attack on all of them. Yeah. And there's a com commitment then to rally to the defense of the whole. Um, there's been a reluctance to invoke that. Part of it is because the country that would most likely invoke it is Turkey. And Turkey, of course, as you know, has a very fraught relationship with the EU at this present time. Uh, and Turkey's, of course, had a standoff with Russia. So I think the Europeans, in some measure, say, well, if we evoke Article 5 on behalf of <coughs> Turkey, we're kind of putting in the hands of, of President Erdogan the future of relations between, for example, the EU and Russia. And we're not sure, so sure we want to do that. We're not so sure Erdogan is that predictable a character. But I think the second reason uh, people have, Europe has been, and, and in some sense maybe the America has been unwilling to invoke Article 5, is once you invoke Article 5, you've got to do something. You've got to do something. You've got to move some troops. You've got to be willing to engage the enemy. And there's a lot of reluctance and uncertainty about just that, what that means and a lot of reluctance to go down that road. So as a consequence, I think, and Barry, you may have a, a view on this, I think that we're just, this Article 5 just kind of sits on the table and nobody wants to pick it up. Where, where does it start, the discussion? At, at NATO headquarters or? That's where it would in, start. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. where it would start. And you know, after the United States was attacked on 9-11, as you well know, uh, um, NATO met and invoked Article 5 to defend the United States. Yeah. Um, and, <coughs> but it would, it would have to start in Brussels, and quite frankly, it would have to start with the United States, because that's a case where the United States would have to come forward and say, we think it ought to be Article 5, because quite frankly, the United States is overwhelmingly the muscle of NATO, and if we're not in, others won't follow. Mm -hmm. So it would have to start with us. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the President is reluctant to do that. Steve, um, that doesn't take care of the discussion about Europe and ISIS, of course, but it's, uh, that's, that's a starting point. The, the um, involvement of Russia, you mentioned uh, Putin, what is his ultimate goal? And he doesn't call you to give you that information, I suppose. <laughs> but what is the suspicion of, of uh, what, what is he up to? I mean, what we read about Putin and I'm actually reading a book about him right now. I mean, this guy is beyond belief, and, and we can't even relate to it, uh, other than Mr. Mr. Trump, who's expressed himself as, as being able to deal with him, as, as we know. But what is it that he is just, is he, does his thinking go back to the czarist thinking, which has really never changed in Russia, of course. It's always been that way. They've always been running the place out of, out of one of the capitals. But... But is that where he is going? Because he's taking a great risk with what he's doing, and he's now talking about the Balkan countries, and uh, I mean, I mean, the Estonias of this world, and, and so on. Where does that go? Is he going, and does he keep on pressing as long as we don't really draw a line in the sand? I, I think that that's bottom line. That's right. Um, you know. Uh, and we in the comp in the Q and A, other people ought to offer views because this is a subject a lot of people have can have a lot of opinions on. Uh, first of all, last time he ran for president, he had a scare electorally, and so one of the things he's about is using these foreign adventures uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Syria, to um, rally the country behind him to consolidate his domestic support, and he's done that brilliantly. I mean, notwithstanding sanctions that are really hurting Russia, his approval rating is over 80 percent, whereas the time the last presidential election was in the 50s. So one, he's using these to consolidate his position at home, and he's doing a very good job. He's going to be with us for a long time. Second, I've always thought he's an opportunist. He is, he's a brilliant tactician. He sees an opening, and he seizes it. And he did it, for example, in Georgia. He did it in Ukraine. And I think then he waits, and he makes a calculation. And you have an initial limited set of objectives, and those objectives will go up depending on whether he's succeeding and whether he's resisted. And I'll give you an example in Georgia in 2008 when he went into Georgia. Initially, um, it was to protect <coughs> the sort of status quo <coughs> territory that Russia uh, controlled and two provinces which he thought were being 
uh, oppressed by Georgia in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. That was his objective. And it, the operation went pretty well. Uh, and so he enhanced his objective, and at one meeting his foreign minister, Lavrov, said to Connie Rice, oh, by the way, we've changed our objectives. We now want the elected government of Prime Minister Saakashvili to step down or we're going to Tbilisi. At which point we went public with that. We started to move equipment into Georgia with military aircraft. We took a military unit that Georgia had in, in Iraq, brought it home for them, made it clear that we were going to resist and he backed down. And so I think he's a brilliant tactician. He, he has a, an overall agenda of trying to reestablish Russian sphere of influence or Russian influence in that part of the world. He would love to split Europe if he can. He would love to water down and make a, dull, a dead letter NATO. But he's pragmatic and fairly risk averse. And my belief is if you oppose him, not in an aggressive way, but oppose him and take things off the table and deny him targets of opportunity and put troops on the ground, for example, in the Baltic states and Central and Eastern Europe and do some exercises and help the Europeans to rebuild their own capacity to defend themselves, it will constrain what he can do. And that's why I think in the end of the day he is manageable. Uh, because he wants to stay in power, he wants Russia to have influence, he wants to have a seat at the table. And that's really what Syria was about. And Syria was really a brilliant operation for him with a modest deployment of aircraft for a period of four or five months. He stabilized his ally, Assad, who was teetering. He established in the region that he's the only reliable country. The United States doesn't seem to stand by its allies, but Russia stands by its allies. Mm -hmm. Um, so he stabilized Assad, he showed he was a reliable partner, and he is now at the head table on the Syrian peace negotiations. That's where Putin wants to be. Putin wants to be at the head table. And my belief is if we will constrain him by our own active diplomacy, by our military deploy deployments, if we will constrain him, we can bound his aspirations um, and work with him at the role in the table, and we may be able to make progress in Syria in the same way we made some progress on the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, so it's a combination of being open, talking with him, <clears throat> dealing with him, as Secretary Kerry is doing, but in a framework where he knows clearly the limits, and we are in a position to enforce the limits on his ambitions. I think that's how you, ha how to, how you have to handle uh, Putin. And it means then you've got to be engaged. You've got to be in Europe. We've got to be reconnected with <clears throat> Europe. We've got to be paying more attention to Europe. And we need to be helping Europe make this very difficult passage that Europe is making trying to deal simultaneously with refugee flows and terrorist attacks <coughs> and Brexit and uh, a, 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 um, an eruption of uh, parties on the right and left that are shaking the politics of Europe. On that subject, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Mrs. Le Pen in France, and there are leaders like that, of course. Uh, Holland is uh, uh, Mr. Wilders with 22 or 3 or 4 percent of the vote. Uh, Britain has them, uh, they, nationalistic types of parties. Where is that going? Well, you have a Wilders that basically says who is the, uh, who's the, um, Men that is running that party in, in Holland, for instance, who, by the way, comes over to Los Angeles and, and collects money from people. It's interesting that they are, here's a leader that most people don't even know, but he, is, he, is, he comes here to get people to give money to his party. So what, where does that go? Is the, is the development of nationalistic parties all over Europe, uh, is that something that we are very concerned about? Uh, yes, and I think you're seeing in Europe the same phenomena as you're seeing in the United States, though it's taking a little different f form. Mm -hmm. um, our former boss, uh, Brad's former boss, uh, George W. Bush, in summer of 2008, he, uh, I, I came into his office and he said, so Hadley, I've got a speech I want to give. And I said, another speech on terrorism, Mr. President, because the President was giving speeches on terrorism all the time. That's the only speech he wanted to give. He said, no, I want to give a speech 
about where I think the world is heading. I want to give a speech calling, sounding the alarm that we are going to see in the years ahead a rise of nativism, read anti-immigration, protectionism, anti-trade, um, and uh, nativism, protectionism, Nationalism. and isolationism. Mm. Everybody going back home. Well, look what's happened. I mean, he was absolutely right. He gave the speech in the summer of 2008. Nobody paid any attention to it. He was absolutely right. And there is a huge disaffection. What I think is going on, you're seeing huge disaffection in Europe, huge disaffection in the United States. 70% of the American people think the country is headed in the wrong direction. Um, there is a belief that governments are failing, they are not solving the problems, that uh, political leaders are in it for themselves, not serving the people. And the difference is, in Europe, it's being acted out by fringe parties on the right and the left outside the mainstream parties. Mm. In the United States, it's being acted out within our political system and within our two parties. You know, there are a number of people who say, I can't decide whether I'm going to vote for Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and on the one hand, you look at that and you say, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but on the other thing, it isn't ridiculous at all. Because they stand for the proposition that politics are broken, politicians are corrupt, Politicians are out of touch. The situation is not serving me. And so I'm giving up on all the political leaders and on the elites, and we're going to somebody who's never been in politics at all. And that's how both Sanders and Trump present themselves. So it's the same phenomenon in acted out, in, in my view, in two different ways. And I have to say, whenever I talk about politics, and I would do that with President Karl Rove would say, Hadley, stick to foreign policy. That's something you know about. Leave <laughs> politics to me. So you got to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But my own view is that it's, that's what's being acted out. D same phenomenon in both places. And the question is the same. The question is the same. Will the center hold? Will mainstream politicians be able to come before their people and convince the American people that these traditional approaches are still the right ones for America? That having an open trading system is still in our interests. That being, being a, a leader of the international system is still in our interests. That being open to immigration, which has been the source of this country's greatness, is still the right thing. Those are the issues that we ought to be debating in this fall election. I was in the Middle East uh, last month, it went to about six or seven countries, and in three or four of them, uh, the leaders I was met with said, you know, the Americans have only one question they need to answer. I said, what's that, Prime Minister? And they said, do you still want to be a superpower or not? Hmm. Do you still want to be a superpower? Because tell us. If you do, that's great. That's our preferred option. But remember, when you're a superpower, there are costs and there are burdens that you and the American people are going to have to continue to bear. If you don't want to be a superpower, tell us and we'll make other arrangements. And I don't think we're going to like those other arrangements because they have China and Russia right. and a lot of other things on them. So I think that's the phenomenon. And I think the big challenge uh, for the fall is whether this we can have a, a, an election where actually that becomes the issues and that we have a debate. And the question is what the American people decide. And I think you will have a clear choice and we'll see. And uh, so this is a challenge for, uh, and in Europe it's a question of whether the center parties can mobilize themselves, can reconnect with their peoples and can uh, rally support and put down the, the, uh, the bids from the, from the fringe parties. And the jury's out because there's a lot of pressure, a lot of unhappiness in both political systems for good reason. And governments and political leaders don't seem to have been able to address them successfully. Steve, you mentioned, I don't know, when do we go to uh, questions, by the way? Is it, are we just about there, time-wise? I don't know. Okay, nobody has the answer. I will make I think the answer. In five minutes, I think we got a in five, five minutes. minutes. Is that it? Okay. Five minutes. Okay, in five minutes. Oh, that's what you were, okay, good. <laughs> Steve, um, so you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the Iran nuclear agreement. Yeah. 
which of course a lot of people are not in favor of, a lot of people are. Um, the question that I have is how good an agreement is it actually? And secondly, is we made, we're making this huge deal out of a deal with Iran who have no nuclear weapons. What is the deal with Pakistan, who is a major nuclear power and has a very large part of their population being jihadists? What are we doing about that? Isn't that in and of itself a, a major threat to the United States? Or do you feel that we have the right agreements in place so as to handle that potential? Because we're concerned about the the Iranians uh, supporting terrorism. Well, how about, how about Pakistan with yeah. the jihadist so population? So okay. when we would meet with President Putin and talk to him about uh, Iran, this was in the times when President Bush was president, he would always say, yeah, I hear about Iran, but I'm more worried about Pakistan. And it was interesting, the Russians always said, you know, Pakistan is the problem, is not Iran. Yeah, interesting. And one of the things that, um, that has come to light publicly uh, and I will just refer to press reports. There have been press reports that the United States for a period of 20 years has had an intensive program uh, for helping Pakistan improve its command and control, its ability to store nuclear weapons safely, to transport them safely, precisely so they don't fall in the hands of terrorists. Now those are press reports um, and I can't comment on them, but it's interesting. It's been, there's been a lot out there in the press. So that's one thing we, if we're not doing, we could be doing is to, and should be doing is try to help Pakistan control those, those weapons. Second, uh, Pakistan has probably the most active nuclear weapons program now going. They are moving to plutonium weapons. Uh, the administration is trying to get the Pakistanis to back off that because it is a provocation with India. So it's a problem, you know, that, that is, can't be solved, has to be managed will never be managed to the point where you'll feel comfortable with it, but there's not much alternative. You know, Pakistan is both an ally in the war on terror and a principal source of terror at the same time. Uh, and, and, you know, two administrations now have wrestled with Pakistan, and I think the best way to, to say it is it's a bad marriage with no uh, opportunity for divorce. All the options of sort of making, uh, there you go, <laughs> that's it. Um, all the discussions about, you know, should we be tougher on, Palest uh, on Pakistan? Should we kind of treat it almost as an adversary? If you run those analyses, they never work out well in terms of American interests. So we need to manage that problem. The real problem is North Korea. You have a certified lunatic who has nuclear weapons, is miniaturizing them, is developing the missiles that can reach the continental United States, much less Alaska and Hawaii, and there's no discussion about that. And the reason there's no discussion about it is that nobody has a good idea about what to do with it. Nobody has a good idea what to do about it. You know, conventional options, don't, military options don't work because South Korea and Seoul is so close to the border is at risk to the North Korean. So this is another dog that this, you know, we've been sort of pretending it's not there and the problem is continuing to get, <coughs> to get worse. The Iran deal, um, we could have a long discussion about it. Um, there are a lot of questions that you can ask. Why did we focus only on the nuclear issue and not have a conversation around with Iran about the other things that are doing it that threaten our interests and our friends and allies, like their subverting um, Iraq, their support for Assad in Syria, uh, their pressure they are putting uh, in Yemen on Saudis and others. Uh, why didn't we talk about those things too? Why did we seal off the nuclear issue from the broader agenda with Iran? A lot of discussions about whether it was negotiated right. Did we give up on enrichment too soon? If we'd held it later, would he've gotten a better deal? For me, the bottom line became, is it better to live with a deal that isn't a great deal? Is it better to live with the deal or is it better to walk away from it? And what are the consequences in each? And I would argue that probably the better course probably is 
despite enormous reservations I have about the deal, I could never see how America's position was better if we walked away from it than if we stayed in the deal, tried to make sure the Iranians respected it, and then developed a policy around the nuclear deal to deal with other aspects of Iranian behavior. That's what I think the new president, whoever it is, is going to um, have to do, have to deal with. But I take comfort from Donald Trump's answer to this question about the nuclear deal. <laughs> Donald Trump, uh, you know, you would have, all the other Republicans said we'd tear it up in the first day. Donald Trump said, look, I've made my living about taking bad deals that other people negotiated and make them better. So, you know, maybe the Donald will have his chance. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> there is something positive coming out of this. Okay, um, the answer is we are now at the point of questions, at which point... Nice to see you. Secretary Cantor, thank you. Sure. Mickey, thank you, thank you so much. In spite of your uh, infirmity, you did well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're wonderful. Thanks, Mickey. Mickey has been our our co-chair up until about two or three months ago when it was taken over by somebody. He is one of the, I happened to see him on television the other day being interviewed on the trade agreements and uh, he's one of the incredibly uh, good people and this is why we are managing in this organization to work so well between parties on both sides. And it's really, really interesting that at the head of the this this team is a Republican and a Democrat, and it's been that way for a long time. And Warren Christopher was the one that insisted on that. It's, it's working. It's working. So in any case, uh, questions. Shall we start at the right or the left? What is it? <laughs> We're starting at the left. Uh, the gentleman that had, had a the gentleman, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, your presentation today. I have a question about uh, NATO. You said the U.S. is NATO's muscle, which raises the free rider question. You know, Secretary Gates raised this issue as well as he departed the, the administration. He said, you know, the American people is not going to stand for the fact that we're spending so much for you. And so isn't it time for uh, the European allies to assume more responsibility, to raise their budgets? What are we going to do about it? Because many administrations have talked about this issue. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if you look at, and, and Barry, I think, probably have these statistics, um, the percentage of the combat capability of NATO that is the United States as opposed to our allies, even now there are, even though now there are 28 countries in NATO, has been going up over the last 20 years. It's now like over 60 percent of the combat powers of America. That's not smart. And they have been free riders. And it is a problem. And we've been hammering at them for 20 years. Um, and the Europeans have disinvested in hard power, as they say, and, and thinking that soft power would be enough to safeguard their security. Soft power, and I would say, quite frankly, relying on the United States for the hard power. And I think what this terrorism crisis and this terrible attacks that occurred in Paris and Brussels and Ankara and elsewhere is, I hope, bringing home to the European people that they need to develop their own hard power both to harden their own countries, but also the hard power to be able to go against ISIS. Because, you know, ISIS, I, I, and I think I'm right about this, some people think, well, if we would just withdraw from the Middle East, draw from NATO, you know, ISIS won't follow us home. Well, that's not true. We withdrew from Afghanistan after we helped the Afghans free it from Russia. We withdrew, and Osama bin Laden used Afghanistan to plot 9-11. So withdrawal doesn't mean, the, the terrorists come after you, <coughs> because if you're the United States, the big target. Secondly, everyone says, well, if we harden ourselves against attack, well, if you, the, you know, it's the old thing, if you rely only on defense, you got to be right 100% of the time if you're going to avoid terrorism. And I think in the end of the day, and this was President Bush's judgment, in addition to those things, you've got to go after the terrorists, you've got to take away their territory, take away the places from which they plan and train and operate. That's what we need to do, and that's what Europe needs to do. 
And I would be, you know, there's been all this pressure on the defense budget, you know, have them increase the percentage of money they spend in the defense budget. I would focus on them, getting them with us operationally <coughs> in the Middle East to bring down the civil wars and to take away territory from ISIS. That's where I would be pushing the, the Europeans. You know, Donald Trump is right about that. They have been free, free riders, and it's shameful. And it's not smart if you're Europe. And they're beginning to see the consequences of it. So, you know, on so many of these things, the, the sort of the outlandish things that whether it's Trump or Sanders are saying, there's a lot of truth at the core of it. And, uh, and uh, Americans are responding to that truth. But it's one thing to, to analyze the problem. It's another thing to come up with the solutions. And those tend to be harder. And that's what we're not debating in our presidential election at this point. And that's where we need to go by the fall. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have a defective microphone here. <laughs> One, two. Oh, there it is. Closer. Um, you talked about withdrawal and the consequences of that. And I just sit wondering, I think when you talk about hesitation of entering into the ground, ground forces into a, uh, a campaign, the question is at the end of your success, what is the alternative to withdrawal? And what will the American people accept in terms of staying in a place to see through to the goals? And I'm perplexed by that. I wonder what you would think about it. It's, uh, it's very hard. Um, and you know, I was in the Bush administration, we did the Iraq War. Iraq War is very controversial. For a, all kinds of, uh, of good reasons. And, uh, and President Obama took very clearly the conclusion that it was a mistake. Uh, we got overcommitted. We should have never gone into Iraq in the first place. And he made it very clear that he was going to avoid those kinds of foolish decisions. What we've learned in the subsequent seven years is there are sins of omissions. You can do too much and have negative consequences. But there are also sins of omission. You can fail to act. And Syria is going to go down in history as a place where we failed to act. And it has resulted in a humanitarian disaster that is threatening not only the stability of all the nations of the Middle East, but even Europe. Um, and so, you know, as, as in this trip, Madeleine Albright and I are doing on a bipartisan basis a study for the Atlantic Council in the Middle East. We took a trip. Uh, and I was mentioning to some of you, you folks in the uh, advance of the, of the dinner, we took a trip to s six countries. And what we heard basically was, in Iraq you did too much, in Syria you're doing too little, why can't you Americans get it right? <laughs> and, and, and that's right. And, and look, you know, the administration is right when they say there is no military solution to the problems in the Middle East. And that's true. The problem is, and what makes these problems so exquisitely difficult, is there's no political solution that does not have a military element when you're <coughs> dealing with people like Vladimir Putin or if you're dealing with ISIS. And so the trick is, can you have a military element that strengthens a political decision that comes to arrangements that bring civil wars to an end? And then can you help countries rebuild societies so that they can provide secure and prosperous governments and futures for their people. And can you do that at an acceptable price economically and in terms of loss of lives? And I think it can be done. It's exquisitely hard. We struggled doing it in Afghanistan. We struggled doing it in Iraq. Uh, it will require us, I think, being partners to these countries after the war is over for decades. We made a mistake pulling out in Iraq in 2011. We would have been better if we'd left 20 or 25,000 troops. It was quiet. They wouldn't have been killed. You know, we would not have had uh, uh, casualty levels. So I think it has required a sustained participation and involvement. 
President Bush used to say, look, we, we need to tell the American people they're going to have to be in Iraq uh, over the long term like we've been in South Korea for 50 or 60 years. And it helped made South Korea one of the most prosperous and stable and secure countries in the world. And I kept saying to him, Mr. President, if you tell that, the American people will never stand for it. Well, as always, he was right and I was wrong. We should have created that expectation. Uh, and if we'd stayed in Iraq with 20, 25,000 troops, you know, it might not have fallen apart once Syria started to blow up. So these are exquisitely difficult decisions. And, um, and we don't really yet have the tool set to help countries stabilize themselves post-conflict. We've invested in our military. We have not invested in those civilian capabilities that you need to do that mission successfully. Yes, sir. Could you comment on the recent piece in The Atlantic which lays out the pre president's uh, foreign policy approach? Uh, you know, I think it's, it's pretty remarkable uh, that he would do that. Um, he's, the, I guess the way I would say it is, is this. He has a different view about how the world works than almost any president, I think, since World War II. He has a different view about how America's, what America's role is in the world. Um, and he really believes Iraq was a terrible mistake and that we should not be involved militarily except for kind of clandestine operations like got rid of Osama bin Laden. I, I think that is his view and I think it's a view that's very much out of step with what Americans' presidents have been since World War II and is very much uh, in my experience, like the 1960s, where a lot of people came out of the Vietnam era in the 1960s, and it was the old Pogo ca ca cartoon, you know, we've met the enemy and he is us, that yeah. really America was not a force for good in, in the world. It was a, at a much more questionable role. I think that's where he is. And he's not a weak man. I mean, he has held to that view over seven years in the face of criticism from the foreign policy establishment, and in, in, in face of pressure from almost all of his cabinet secretaries to do something different. But I think he just has a, a, a different view of the world, of how it works, what America's role in, and that is reflected in foreign policy. I think if you look at the last seven years, you'd have to decide it hasn't worked out very well. And I had thought until the emergence of Donald Trump that whoever became president, whether Republican or Democrat, uh, would return to a more traditional American view of the world and our role in it. And I'm not so sure that'll be the case. And I think, in fact, if the nominees are Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, I think that may be a, a major issue in the fall debate. I hope it would be a major issue in the fall debate. It goes to that big question of, do you want to be a superpower or not? And I think President Obama answered that question, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I happen to think that answer is wrong, but I think that is an issue that needs to be debated here in the fall. That'd be my take. But others, you know, can offer their own views, um, be interested to hear them. We're going back to the, uh, yes, sir. We're going back to the left. Can you explain the, you know, the lack of administration support for the Kurdish uh, Kirshmega and the uh, Obviously, they're successful in asserting both controlling land and uh, moving against ISIS. And I just can't understand why there's not more support there, financial, military, et cetera. It just doesn't make sense to me. You know, I, I'm not in the administration, and, and Barry may have a, a better view on this, and so you are <coughs> put up. I think, actually, we have been supporting them. And we've been doing training with them, giving them uh, equipment. There was a lot of... Uh, complaints that we were giving them equipment through the Iraqi military and the military wasn't passing them on. I was in Iraq and I was told that just wasn't the case. So I, I think actually there has been a fair amount of support for the Peshmerga. Another related question is why isn't there more support for an independent Kurdistan? And I think there are a lot of good reasons not to do that at this point. Uh, because I think it would just be an added disruption um, for uh, a, and uh, the reaction of 
Turkey you can imagine. Turkey is basically at war with the Kurds. It would really unstick Iraq. It would leave the Sunnis at the hands of the Shia in Iraq, something they won't stand up for. So I think it would um, exacerbate the problems for Turkey and really precipitate the, the coming apart of Iraq. And again, developments which, given the turmoil in the Middle East, I don't think we need. So I think the issue of, of whether there will be an independent Kurdistan is on the agenda for some future point. I think it's not an issue now. But my sense is that we have been arming the pressure, America, and we certainly should. Because my strategy, my view is that we should be arming those willing to fight ISIS. We should be training them, we should support them, we should embed them in them, and we should help them to succeed. Uh, and that's certainly the case in, in Iraq. The problem in Syria is that the Turkish uh, government views that very threatening. And it was, it was made concrete here just in the last week when the Kurds in Syria announced an autonomous Kurdish zone within Syria. Well, that's the kind of thing that scares the Turks to death because the Turks don't want their Kurds to declare an autonomous Kurdish zone in Turkey. Uh, so I, I think um, it's, it's a complex situation. My sense is that we are arming the Peshmerga and we certainly should be. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your great insight today. Um, I'm very curious, uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, what you think uh, the Edward Snowden affair uh, was uh, damaging to our national security interests? Uh. I think it was hugely damaging. Um, it uh, called into question a whole series of programs that are essential for keeping the country safe. Um, it tried to convince the American people that they were ill-advised, illegal, and out of control. And after all the inquiry that was done as a result of Snowden, um, it turns out that all of those programs were well controlled and there were no uh, legal violations that were, were found. Uh, and so for all the hysteria about, you know, one more secret of the CIA or NSA or somebody out of control, it wasn't the case. These were as well regulated and professional as they can be, and they are essential if we're going to keep this country safe. Uh, and it disrupted uh, a, a number of relations with our allies, and as I said at the beginning, close relationships with allies is the only way we're going to win. You know, ISIS is a network, and the only way you're going to defeat a network is to have a better network than the bad guys got. And that means we got to be sharing information in real time. And of course, Snowden made that much more difficult by turning our allies in some sense against it. I think it was a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Um, were you looking for a, did you have a question? Oh, I did, yes, thank you. You look like the CNBC reporter, by the way, who, it can't be you because she's in Belgium today. I have to know. It might be two of me. Um, <laughs> there could be. It could be. I don't know if this is so, Bring it close to you in a little bit. Oh, is that better? Yes. Um, you, I, you did mention Saudi Arabia, and of course, when the Iran deal was happening, there was a lot of angst among the Saudis about a possible retreat um, in, our, in our relationship with them. And I'm just curious what you think our relationship with Saudi Arabia is going forward, and particularly since you know there's clear evidence that they finance a lot of <clears throat> a lot of terrorist groups, and they're our issues and our relationships with them, of course. Thank you. Yeah, there are. It is a fraught relationship. It's a long-standing relationship. You know, it, it, we, you know, with all uh, consideration of the sensibilities of our Saudi friends, it's pretty clear that ISIS arose in a context where a number of countries uh, had been exporting very extremist ideology in terms of materials and training of uh, imams and building mosques and the like. It, 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 it helped create a fairly extreme and toxic environment. And, you know, Saudis would tell you 
A, we didn't do it, or B, we did it in reaction to what the Iranians were doing because the Iranians were trying to subvert our influence. Uh, there's, you know, the Qataris on one side, there's Saudis on the other. There's a lot of blame to go around. Uh, around. Um, I think Saudi has, um, because of the attacks that occurred in 2004 and because it became a target itself, Saudi has largely cleaned up its act. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Um, and it is still an ongoing issue in Saudi Arabia. And I'll give you this example. We were there, Madeleine Albright and I, on this trip, and we met with the Minister of Education. Interesting fellow. He, four year, six years earlier, had written uh, two books which basically said you've got to get religion out of education. It's, it's soiling education. It's radicalizing education. You need to separate religion from education. And the book was banned in Saudi Arabia. Both books were banned for five years. And then literally about a month or two ago, notwithstanding the banning of the books, <coughs> this man was made Minister of Education and told to implement the approach that was set out in his books. <laughs> so, you know, this is a, you know, this is a conflicted society. Um, uh, what gives me hope is that there is a Deputy Crown Prince who is really running the show and has assembled enormous power in his hands and is, is moving the country in a very reformist agenda, which I think is basically in the right direction. But, you know, it comes late in the process. You know, it's 2016, and we knew there was a problem with what the Saudis were doing in 2001, and the Saudis should have as well. So again, you know, these are one of these relationships where you're destined to struggle with your friends and allies, uh, trying to work with them to try to get them to move in the right direction. And the question is, so how do you move allies? How do you move allies in a positive direction? And there are two schools of thought. One view is, and whether the allies are Israelis and the issue is Middle East peace, or whether it's Saudis getting them to stop you know, exporting extremist ideology, or whether it's the Pakistanis, there's two views. One says you pressure your allies, you make public statements, you use economic sanctions if you can, you, you coerce them to do what you want them to do. Um, President Bush had a different view. His view is if you want allies to do hard decisions, you put your arm around them and you embrace them and you say, I know what I'm asking you is very hard, but it's for the long-term good of your country, it's on the good of us and the relationship, and if you make these hard decisions, I will be with you every step of the way. I think that's how you get allies to move. And that means even as difficult as the Pakistanis are, even as difficult as the, Air, the Saudi Arabia is, you stay with them. You stay with them. And you don't call them free riders. And you don't stand equidistance between Saudi Arabia and Iran and sort of say, fie on both your, ho your houses. Why, won't, why can't you get along? I think in these situations, you've got to decide. And you've got to be clear who your friends and allies are. And I think Saudis are a friend and ally, and the way to get them to move in the right direction is to engage with them. Uh, it isn't to, uh, to distance ourselves from them. But, you know, you could, there are other people who would make the argument in just the other way. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Three questions that put their hands up, so we're going to get three in 10 minutes because we have to get you out of here at two, I'm told. Uh, the gentleman over here, yes, please. Go ahead, yes. Um, uh, talking about difficult allies, the Turks. Um, you've touched on them a few times, but more indirectly. Uh, we're out of sorts with the Turks, uh, but the Turks are <coughs> experiencing a rising tide of terrorism, uh, just as the Europeans are, and is that going to make any kind of a difference and how they start responding to ISIS uh, and other issues. I would hope so. I think it has. Um, you know, it is interesting that some months ago they allowed us to fly air operations out of Incirlik, which is an air base they have, against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And they've continued to allow us to do that, even though we've had a big fight about 
the Syrian Kurds. We've been arming and helping them and training them and supporting them, and the Turks don't like it because they view those Kurds as very, Syrian Kurds as allied with the PKK, which is a Kurdish terrorist group that has killed tens of thousands of people in Turkey. So in spite of that disagreement, um, they have allowed us to continue operations out of Insulik. I think this is a case, a relationship we're, which we're um, condemned to struggle. And, and one of the things I think we've got to do, and, and secondly, I would say Erdogan is a very difficult person. You know, the one thing that the Chinese political system has done very well, their system basically gives you, if you're the supreme leader, if you will, in <coughs> China, they give you 10 years and you're out. There's a lot of evidence that after about seven or eight years, you know, people don't get better with age as leaders. Look at Putin. Look at Erdogan. He's another guy that stayed in power too long. And, uh, and he's going to be a problem for us. But I, I think the way you have to deal with it is you have to reach some kind of understanding. I'll give you another boring vignette. Um, so President Bush, at the beginning of the Bush administration, needed to understand Ariel Sharon. So he sent me over, Deputy National Security, to go to meet Ariel Sharon and find out what he feels about the settlements. So I, I went and I sat down and I gave him the letter from the President and I said, and I wasn't quite candid, I said, Mr. Prime Minister, the President told me I should come meet with you and I should stay here in Jerusalem talking to you as long as you need to tell me everything you want the President of the United States to know about your view about settlements. And Sharon sat back and he said, no one's ever asked me my views. Think about that. Think about how neurologic settlements had been in, has been in U.S.-Israel relations for decades. Nobody ever asked me. I think that's what we've got. You know, our diplomacy, our diplomats fly in. They have a series of meetings. No meeting lasts more than an hour, an hour and seven minutes. So you have travel time to get the next meeting, and then we fly out again. You know, we've got to have much more in-depth conversation with our allies to try to reach a common understanding. So I would send somebody to Turkey, and I would tell them, don't come back until we've got an understanding with Erdogan on how we're going to fight the uh, ISIS and what we're going to do about the Syrian Kurds and anything else Erdogan wants to talk about. That's what we've got to start doing with our allies. And we're not, we're not designed to do that now. Next, next to the last question. First, thank you very much for coming in for your very thoughtful comments, and particularly the most recent one. The question I have is based on the premise that American foreign policy derives from interaction between the president, the career bureaucracy, the political appointees that a president brings with him, the Congress, and the general public. Um, my observation would be that expertise about international affairs in the Congress has declined. Uh, that mass public opinion is where you yourself characterized it uh, and wh what we see. It's, it's not in support of the sort of uh, bipartisan line of American foreign policy of a long period of time. Uh, given those two comments, um, how do you see, because obviously none of us knows how the election will turn out, you've, in your comments, have made it clear that you think uh, th th any possibility, or particularly among two candidates that you mentioned frequently, uh, is possible. Um, how do you see the uh, elements of a sane uh, uh, and uh, uh, sustainable American foreign policy uh, e uh, emerging after the next election what, uh, in terms of the role of the president, the <coughs> political appointees, and the career bureaucracy. I think you've described it right. All of those groups you described <coughs> play in the process, but I have been um, impressed by how dominant the president is. Because, you know, they all have their say. Um, and in the end of the day, it is the president who largely makes the final call. And, you know, they get all their advice from the Congress, from the professional folks, from their cabinet secretaries. But in the end of the day, at the end of the NSC meeting, the president says, 
Thank you all. This has been a very useful meeting. I'm going to go think about it, and I'll tell you what I've decided in the next day. And nobody really knows what happens in the president's mind between the end of the NSC meeting and the next morning when they come into the Oval Office and say, I've made a decision. Uh, it's about what the, the president's theory of history is, what uh, their view is of the leaders they're dealing with, what is their reading of the politics, what is the read of motivations, what are the values and principles they bring to decisions. That's what really matters. And so what I think people need to be looking for when we finally get two candidates and we go into the fall season is those kinds of questions. And I would hope the, the questers and all that would try to bring those out. What is in this candidate's mind? What is the set of values, principles, historical perspective, theories of the world about America's role in the world? What do they bring to the table? Because in the end of the day, those really matter. Those really matter. I mean, if I, I, I trained with a professor whose view about foreign policy was it was largely determined by economic interests and then I had about 40 years in this business, I think it's heavily dependent on the views of the person who's sitting in the Oval Office. And boy, that's what you need to make a judgment on. Because you can give all the smart advisors in the world, but in the end of the day, at the end of the NSC meeting, the president goes off and, and makes a decision. And it's so all Steve, those other things. what that would mean to me, that statement, that the person that gets to him last has a great deal of influence, which means, <laughs> which means most likely will be his wife. <laughs> so I wonder whether in history that, that uh, turns out to be the case. I mean, we, we know about Mrs. Reagan, no question about it, but, but historically they leave the meeting at eight o'clock at night or whatever they do and they get up the next morning at five and have made a decision. Now who's gotten to them in the meantime? <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> anyway, so, one last question we have. To uh, mention a, another troubled country, but uh, no mention has been made of Afghanistan. And uh, what do you see the future there is? Uh, very tough. For the U.S. It's, the situation is very tough. It is not hopeless, but it's very hard. And there's a case where I hope this president and the next president will decide that a continuing modest U.S. investment diplomatically, economically, and with some military forces is in our interest to try to stabilize Afghanistan so it doesn't once again fall back and become a safe harbor for terrorists. <clears throat> but it's, it's one of these ones that, you know, we've got to be willing to do it over the long term. And I think the American people will support it as long as there are not a lot of American casualties and deaths. Thank you, all of you, for being here today. You. Steve, uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council. I think this is a great beginning of a relationship that we're going to look into. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. By all thank means, thank you. It's really great, enjoyed great it. Wonderful. Again.